Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I guess we'll just start fielding questions from the audience, uh, make this as brief as possible. Um, we'll just start. We will take the question from um, Patrick Vernon. We'll take your question. If you please unmute your mic and uh, ask. Hi, uh, yes, uh, I'm with uh, Fox News. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, I've heard reports that your client had uh, multiple tiny accomplices in this crime. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Well, uh, um, an accomplice is uh, is only as responsible as the uh, main perpetrator, and and in all cases, we are we are looking to hold everybody responsible for this despicable act uh, accountable. Uh, next question, Mr. Herring. Um, yes, I'm with Nestle Tollhouse, and I was just wondering, um, is this going to affect um, the perpetrator's business schedule in any way? Well, uh, as always, my client, the Keebler Elf, is looking towards uh, maximizing production. Um, apolo apologies, my my client is is looking to uh, actively compete with the Keebler Elf, uh, keep keep business up, keep keep profit margins up, and um, keep the business intact. Because as we all know, we never want a blunder like this to affect affect the jobs of so many. Uh, we'll take a question from Hannah Marin. Hi, yeah, I'm here with Beloved Childhood Characters News. Um, your client was a role model for a lot of children, and we're wondering uh, how he would respond to the accusation that he's setting a bad example for so many of his fans. Well, I mean, there's there's the uh, there's the uh, the age old argument: separate art from artist, and um, that's really what's going to have to happen with this specific case. Um, uh, as always, uh, role models aren't always the people you expect them to be. Ivan Lee? Uh, hi, I'm from News News. Is it true that after the crime, your client was found hiding in a factory? Um, as always, we can't speak on these rumors just about yet, but um, we do want to, want to keep clear what is truth and what is fiction. Um, and, and of course, uh, a, pr a, production, a production character like this is always, always interested in, in, in seizing the means and, and making an effective work job. Uh, we'll take a question from Griffin Keel. Hi, I'm here with Big News Company Incorporated. Um, I just wanted to know, did your client use any of his uh, little gizmos and machines when he committed this crime? Um, I mean, gizmos and machines are, are uh, is equally to, uh, to certain just uh, minions and other such things. Um, the, these, these gizmos and machines equally responsible, and we can't comment just yet on the uh, the nature of these gizmos and machines, but We'll look forward, uh, we'll look moving forward into it. Uh, Patrick Vernon. Yes, uh, as a uh, candy store owner myself, I was, uh, I was wondering if the, uh, the one Charlie Bucket had anything to do with this? Well, um, you know, m m uh, all, all speculation, all rumor, and, and um, honestly, in keeping up with, with competing with cookie brands and other such sweet companies like the Keebler Corporation, uh, Mr. Wonka is focusing on on taking action, moving forward, and and uh, producing a, a better environment uh, for everybody, uh, and that first step, of course, always comes with apologizing for for just the heinous acts he did. Um, we'll take a question now from Patrick Vernon again. Back to you. Yes, uh, I'm your uh, local high school English teacher, and I was wondering. Uh, uh, now, Mr. Wonka had taken various children on field trips before, but this act involved a field trip of his own, if I'm not incorrect. Do you have I anything mean, to say? Um, Mr. Wonka, Mr. Wonka, the, the, the parents of, of said students signed uh, permission slips. They signed the correct forms and the documents. Um, and, and, and Mr. Wonka, Mr. Wonka uh, will take action and will be held accountable. But, um, it, again, just speculation, just rumor, and we want to make sure everybody is safe. Uh, another question? Yes, Hannah Marin. Hi, I'm the other English teacher, and I just wanted to know, um, is Willie happy? Is he happy that he ruined this for everyone else in the class? Well, I, I mean, happiness is, is when, when you're a man as jovial as Mr. Wonka, happy, happiness is always, always 
you know, incongruous with what you do. So, so of course, um, Mr. Wonka is always in a happy state. We're looking to keep his positivity up and make sure that that the uh, the this doesn't hinder his reputation. Um, we'll take a question from Mudit Mathur. Hi, I'm the head of the English department. We just wanted to know how your client feels about setting such an example of dishonesty for the students there. Isn't that just a terrible thing? Um, I mean, uh, Willy Wonka is, is, has always been a, a man of, 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 of quiet nature. He's always been a man that, that uh, students, students and, and people, people, friends of his have always looked forward to uh, hearing from him and other such niceties. Um, the, the truth is Mr. Wonka can't quite fully accept his actions yet. Um, and that's something we're working with him and, and therapists and, and other people are working with him towards bettering this. Um, but right now we just need to get to the core of the issue. Uh, we'll take a question from B Burns. Hi, I'm B Burns from the Calligraphy News. Does, does Willy Wonka's parents know what he did? Um, I mean, we, we, this is nationwide news, ladies and gentlemen, we should assume everybody in the nation will be hearing Mr. Wonka's story by the end of this. Um, and that's, what's important is getting, getting, getting ahead of the rumors and speculation. Uh, Mr. Harry. Um, sir, I'm with the, um, Ticonderoga foundation. And I was just wondering, does your client really think that one field trip was worth all this controversy? Well, I mean, uh, taking students to the pencil factory is always, always something that is that is frowned upon by Willy Wonka as he's a direct competitor with the pencil factory in making and uh, making products uh, for schools and students. Um, and as always, looking forward, moving forward. Uh, Callum Ackerman. Hi, I'm from the uh, Tri-State Area Weekly, and I was just wondering, as this is a violation of the academic integrity policy, as Mr. Wonka did assume another person's identity, will he be suspended for his actions? Um, Mr. Wonka, Mr. Wonka taking students on a field trip is is something that is is not what we're looking for right now, and we're 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 trying to get to the bottom of this identity fraud issue of this of this this central core issue that we're looking for. Um, we'll take a question from Colin Ryan. Uh, hi, I'm from Outback Steakhouse. Um, I wanted to know, when did the parents realize that they were being played? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's all a matter of, of when the news gets out and when this information hits public eyes. We don't quite know um, what reactions are just yet, and we're, we're looking forward to fielding this response before more a actions happen. Uh, Mr. Vernon? I'm a local mother, and I am outraged that Mr. Wonka would do something like this. Would do something like this. The, the parents need to know. Was there another hand that touched that paper with a pencil? I mean, uh, ma'am, with, with all due respect, cheating on tests, um, cheating, getting students to cheat, uh, cheat the law. Cheat, cheat moral code, moral compass is always something we don't want. And, and that's exactly what Mr. Wonka did. Uh, we'll take a question from Mr. Herring. Um, yes, I'm uh, Sergeant George Millard from the local police department. I was just wondering, was this your client's first infraction? Because by the looks of this handiwork, it seems like he's very, very experienced in this particular crime. Um, forging documents, forging, forging documents, forging papers, um, uh, forging signatures even are things that, that Mr. Wonka is strongly against. And this, this was a one-time slip up people. And I can, I can, I can guarantee that. Um, we'll take a question now, uh, regarding, regarding Mr. Wonka's, uh, future and looking towards what he can better, uh, and, and put this, this nasty incident behind us. Um, uh, Mr. Ryan? Uh, yes, uh, we were. There were rumors spreading that uh, Mr. Wonka has been seen um, in the Middle East in some places in, in the deserts. Is there any reason it is related at all to his uh, previous crimes? Um, uh, we we hope these aren't related to his previous crimes. We hope Mr. Wonka has gone into uh, hiding from the public eye just for a little bit with his with his various factories around the world. Um, we hope that we can find he can find some some solitude. 
uh, in this in this moment of of darkness for him. Um, we'll take a question from Mr. Herring. Uh, hi, yes, I'm asking on on behalf of the uh, tourism uh, tourism department. Um, I was just wondering, what does Mr. Wonka intend for this uh, for this project? Does he want to go for like the authentic, more triangular, or kind of a Central American stair step model? Um, Mr. Wonka, Mr. Wonka, as always, is a philanthropist. He's looking to to better things and and. With this, with this building a pyramid project, Mr. Wonka will always be, always be looking to adjust the Wonka brand and and uh, take chocolate to a new new level, um, elevate chocolate to a new level, if you will. Um, and with that, I think that is all our time we have, um, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you, and I hope we can put this nastiness behind us. And scene. Well done, Billy. Uh, so, welcome to the second improv show of the year. It's now the year 2021, uh, and we have a all-star cast to present to you today. <laughs> so, I'll start off. I'm the president of improv. My name is Patrick Vernon. I'm a senior at Severna Park High School, and, uh, I was wearing a pineapple shirt earlier today. Hi, I'm Hannah Merritt. I'm the vice president. I'm a junior at Sabrina Park High School. Um, and I'm not creative enough to come up with something to say right now. Hi, I'm Rudit Mather. I'm a senior at Sabrina Park, and uh, I really like panini. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Herring. I'm a senior at Sabrina Park High School, and I like mossy logs. Hi, I'm Callum Ackerman. I'm also a senior at Sabrina Park High School, and I am seven foot six. Hi, I'm Griffin Keel. I'm a junior at Sferna Park High School, and um, I am not seven foot six. Hi, I'm Billy Atkinson. I'm a junior at Severna Park, and I follow Griffin in the order of our names. Hi, I'm Ivan Lee. I'm a junior. My friends called me Ivan, but you can call me Ivan. Hi, I'm Colin Ryan. Uh, I'm a senior at Severna Park High School. Yeah, and I go to high school. Hi, I'm B. Burns, and I'm a senior at Severna Park, and it smells like frogs in my room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, I think we'll get started with our first game. Our first game of the evening is going to be a game by the name of Two Line Vocabulary. Now, this game is going to be featuring three improvisers, and that is Billy, B, and Hannah. So, the 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 special part about this game is that B and Billy can only say two total lines and Hannah Marin can say as many as she wants. Now, why does that matter? Hannah Marin is, go is going to be teaching Hannah Marin, how do you feel about teaching wizardry? Sure, I well, I can teach wizardry. Hannah Marin will be teaching B and Billy wizardry. Now, B and Billy, it's time for you two to get your two lines. We're going to start with B. So B. Sir, yes, sir. How can you work with the line? Can you repeat that? Sir, yes, sir. And for your second line, uh, how does dragons are the best substitutes? Does that work for you? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Okay. And Billy, your two lines. Billy, how do you feel about what's for dinner, honey? Sounds great. And for your second line, how do you feel about, ma'am, you always raise my blood pressure. Sounds good. So to recap, Hannah Marin is teaching B and Billy wizardry, but B can only say the lines. Can you repeat that? 
and, and dragons are the best <laughs> substance substitutes. Substitute. Uh, and Billy, your two lines. Um, honey, what's for dinner? And ma'am, you're raising my blood pressure. Perfect. You three may get started. All right, and welcome to our very first day of your beginner spells. I assume you all have all your supplies, your wands, everything. Yes? Honey, what's for dinner? I have never met you before, uh, young man. Um, and honestly, I'm not really comfortable with you talking to me that way. Um, I'm, we'll just, we'll move on. Okay, so uh, you've all been taught, I, uh, I assume you've been exposed to your kind of generic spells. There's the abracadabra. You've probably heard of, um, I don't know. Open sesame is another classic Man, that we all know and love. Blood pressure. Can you repeat that? Um, Ma'am, you're raising my blood pressure. I have to keep an eye on you this year. Okay. Um, yes. Honey. So you, you, we've What's all heard dinner? your classic. All right. Um, well, we'll come back to that later. Let's talk about your magic words. Um, despite, uh, you know, popular belief, you don't, the words don't really matter. You can really say anything as long as you have the intention behind it. Um, and so you can get creative with your magic words. Honey, you what's can, for dinner? Um, you could use that. Yeah, you Man, can use that as your magic pressure? words. Yeah, I mean, that does technically, although it- Man, sounds, you're raising my blood pressure. It sounds like- that? Ma'am, you're raising uh, my blood pressure. Ma'am, you're raising my blood pressure was. Uh, you repeat that? Ma'am, you're raising my blood pressure. Um, if you do want to sound like you're uh, hitting on your target in like a very weird way, you are welcome to use "Ma'am, you're raising my blood pressure," oh my and also <laughs> "Honey, what's dragons for dinner. are the best substitutes." Honey. I, yeah, sure. You can use what's dragons in your, magic, in your magic words. Um, Let's let's start with a really basic one. Um, you can, can you make uh, a small light. We'll be starting with a very very basic beginner spell. Um, it will just create a small little bubble, like a bubble of light in front of you. And like I said before, you can really use any word that comes to your mind. Um, let's just for example, uh, frog. That'll work. You know, you wanted the light. The light will appear. Um, let's have each of you. Man, you're shot. raising my blood pressure. <laughs> yes, that it did in fact work. You, although I, just to remind you, you can use any word you want. Anything. Dragons are the best. <laughs> there you go. You did it. I you you got it. I just would like to come back to the point that you can. Use any words. There's so many options. Man, and you're you raising my blood it. pressure. I mean, you're doing it. I can't complain, but hey, also- what's for dinner? Man, you're raising my blood pressure. You Man, you're pressure. raising my blood pressure. Okay, give it one Man, more shot. Man, you're raising my one. blood pressure. There you go. There you go. Okay. Scene. Um. <laughs> 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 well done, Billy. Well done, B. Well done, Hannah. Uh, I think we're going to move right on into our next game, which will be a TED Talk presented by Griffin Keel. Now, Griffin has never seen the slideshow that I'm about to present, but he'll be presenting it anyway. Griffin, are you ready to give your presentation? I am. You have the floor. Hello, Tatooine. I am uh, Griffin Keel, and I'm here to provide you with my state-of-the-art TED Talk. Uh, let's just get right into it. So these are two farmers. Um, now, something's changed about this classic image that you might have seen before. You see, normally, they're just normal farmers. But now, in the age of technology, they can use selfies. Now, what is this painting? 
this is the classic painting of uh, God and uh, Adam. Now, uh, what's happening in this painting? It's uh, it's debatable. But what is one thing for certain is that uh, payas are involved. Now, what does that mean? What does that have to do with technology? Well, don't worry. It's all related. Because you see, uh, these fruits are native to the southern hemisphere, payas, as you can see in the tree. Um, they were used by uh, ancient peoples um, who uh, would eat them. And, uh, you know, that's often how they sustain themselves off of this fruit. Now, what does it have to do with the first age, 21st century and technology? You see, we eat less payas now that we have phones. We consist off of our selfies and TV and technology, and we've abandoned our classical diet of fruit and such, like these classical paintings you see here. That is why I am per that's why I'm introducing introducing the papaya enzyme. Now, the papaya enzyme is a substitute that can give you back those papayas that you stop eating now that we're in the modern day, uh, refuel them back into your body, which would be a perfect combination of classical Mona Lisa and Van Gogh holding your phone and holding your selfies and doing your 21st century problems with the power of those classical peoples that we used to have in the past. As you can see, these are more fruits that were also eaten by people in the past. And as you can see in the painting, they're extremely happy um, and enjoying themselves because they have this heavier fruit diet, which can be reintroduced back into your system through the papaya enzymes that I'm selling. This is just a funny fruit I added because I liked his face. As you can see, uh, people back in the olden days also liked his face. That is, that's a depiction of how uh, a classical artist might have reacted if they had seen this funny fruit picture I found using my phones and the technology provided in the 21st century. Now these funny fruits uh, would probably make most people from the classical age laugh. This woman here, uh, she seems kind of uh, not a very like not a very person who finds uh, funny fruit faces very comedic. So she doesn't appear to be laughing, but most classical people would find my funny fruit pretty funny. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, uh, Katoween, for attending. Uh, please buy my papaya enzymes. Well done, well done, well done. Did you, did you think they were called papayas? <laughs> I don't know what they're called, I'm gonna be honest. They're called papayas. Okay. Very funny. All right, this next game is called He Said, She Said, and it'll run like kind of a standard scene, but with a slight twist. Um, after each line that each of the two characters says, uh, another improviser will add on uh, with a he said, she said, or they said, and get to modify the scene however they want. Um, in this game, we have Ivan and B as our two characters, and Colin is our narrator. Um, we will be getting a noun. Noun. All right, we'll be getting a noun for this game. Ivan and B, how do you feel about hot sauce? Sure. Got a thumbs up from Ivan. All right, uh, and Colin, you're ready as well. You are good to go. You know, a lot of people say this is the hottest sauce ever, but I think I can take it. He said, quivering with excitement. I bet you probably could. And also, like, hot sauce is actually really good sometimes, unless you put it on, like, fries or whatever. She said, with a hint of doubt in her voice. Yeah, ever since I've eaten hot sauce, I've gotten so much hotter. He said, passing the bottle. <laughs> you bet. Of course. Maybe I should have some. She said, with a big gold smile on her face. Now be careful because the hot sauce is hot. <laughs> he pointed out. It was quite obvious, but he felt, he felt the need to clarify. 
Oh, is it? I think I might be able to handle it. She said, confident as ever. Go ahead, eat the hot sauce. He said as she gulped down a big old gulp. Oh, that doesn't taste very good. She said, drenched in sweat. The hottest sauce ever in the Americas, Europe, and Antarctica. You should be careful how much you consume. He said, making sure she didn't overdose on this very spicy hot sauce. I'd like to have some more, please. She dared him, and he passed her another bottle. It's a good thing I ended up making the store end up out of stock by how much hot sauce I bought. He boasted because he keeps tons of hot sauce in his pantry. I can't find the hot sauce in your pantry. She said, quite confused, because he had just said that there was lots of hot sauce in his pantry. You know, one of the side effects of hot hot sauce is temporary blindness. He said, pointing out the fact that uh, B was now actually blind. <laughs> I can't see you. She pointed see out. See him. <laughs> Perfect. Very well done. Moving on to our next game of the evening. This is a game that was inspired by another. Uh, and we only have a working title for it right now, and that is Angel and Devil. So this scene is going to have four improvisers in it, and that's going to be Ivan, Callum, Ben, and Colin. And the way that this scene works, Ben and Colin will have a regular two-person scene, just the two of them having a blast. And the special part of this scene is that Ben is hallucinating and seeing a small angel and a small devil on his shoulders that'll whisper sweet nothings in his ear. Now, who are these angel and devil? Ivan is an angel and Callum is a devil. Now, at any point, Callum or Ivan can clap in to the scene to talk to Ben and only Ben. And Ben will clap them out and continue his two-person scene. Are you four ready? We've got nods and thumbs up. You four have the floor. Hey there, sport. How are you liking this baseball game? Oh, it's great, Dad. I'm really glad we made it to one of Cooper's games, finally. I know. We've been putting it off for quite a while. But look at him out there. He's having so much fun. I, I don't really... Is he the water boy? Listen here, Steve. You know your brother's not the water boy. He's the starting pitcher. You better, is... you better catch up, Steve. Because your dad loves your brother way more than you right now. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to watch the game. You think watching the game is good enough? You gotta be in that game. I, I'm not on the team. You should make your brother and your father feel good. Remember that. Always let your feelings be true feelings. Oh, there you go again. Next time, Always Angel. making it about other people. We're worried about Steve right now. You should go on that field and break your brother's leg. But wouldn't he lose the game then? Yeah, but then you could take his place. But And with it, your father's love. If you break the other team's legs... Your brother's team will win. But, but I, I, I want to make Dad happy. Isn't, isn't breaking Cooper's kneecap savagely with the lead pipe I brought in my pants leg kind of going to make him a little bit you know, less than happy? Why do you think you brought the lead pipe in the first place? Well, to Take hit it. foul balls away from my dad. Hey, uh, Stevie, it's, uh, what's that in your, is that in your pant leg? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a little hard right there. Um, yeah, I, I was just really excited to go to this game. So I, um, I brought a uh, lead pipe in my pants leg just in case any foul balls came our way, you know, just to hit them back to Cooper. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, we have gloves in, in the car. 
I'm not sure why you took the kitchen. Well, I also pipe. have a lead pipe in my pants. Steve, oh. Steve, Steve, you know that's not why you brought the lead pipe. Okay, it, it's it's already messed up. Just hit your father with it and get it over with. No, don't hit your father. That'll make it so much worse. He'll be then who am I supposed to sad at you. This is such an awkward interaction already. Just get it over with. Knock him out. He won't remember it. I... Tiny you know angel? Hit your own leg. Break your own leg. That What's will that gonna take do? the attention away from your brother and your father. And you won't have uh, to worry about them. I, I can agree with that. I say break your own leg. All right, I'm going to do it. Hey, uh, Stevie, what are you doing with that lead pipe? What do you mind? Oh my gosh, Stevie! It's, it's it's a little bit stuck. Stevie, what are you doing to yourself? Oh, <laughs> the bone! It's sticking out of your leg. <laughs> oh, put it back! Put it back! What are you doing? You me now, Dad. No, Stevie! Stevie, stop! Stevie, stop it! Cut it out! I, I did it for you. <laughs> what do you mean you did it for me? I don't understand. You just bashed a lead pipe against your knee. How does that help me? The little angel on my shoulder sure seems to think it'll help. Scene. Scene. Well done, you four. This uh, is a very early adaptation of this game, and you did perfect. So, with all that being said, I think we're going to move on into our next TED Talk. Now, this TED Talk will be just like the one before, It'll be a different presentation given by a different man, this one being Benjamin Herring. Now, Ben Herring, are you prepared? No, but let's do it anyway. Checks out. Let me get it up and running. Ben, you have the floor. Hey guys, it's me, Captain Crimson Blade, coming at you from the Bermuda Triangle. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope y'all are having a very good night. Now, the Bermuda Triangle is very, very notable for how many sailors go missing there. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but it's actually because almost all of the sailors who have been to the Bermuda Triangle were wearing ankle weights, which just happened at the exact moment they were in the Bermuda Triangle. They like collectively were too much for the boat to handle since all of them were wearing ankle weights and that actually pushes the boat like downwards into the water. And that is why there are so many ships that go missing there. It's all because of the ankle weights. And of course here you can see on the, um, the coast of Scotland here, um, which, you know, is a little bit upstream from the Bermuda triangle where you can see right on this sea cliff, a similar instance of, what I've been dubbing the ankle weight effect, where if you're standing really, really close to the water on a ship, or in this case, on a cliff, sometimes you'll end up just punching through the ground you're standing on because your weights are just too heavy and falling into the water. This wasn't always a cliff. This used to be a meadow. But as, as people used to like stand in this meadow with their ankle weights on, just doing like calisthenic exercise with their ankle weights, and then, boom, the ground just disappears, and it's all ocean now. <laughs> and, of course, people have been starting to figure this out. People know, like, you know, if you wear ankle weights, you're probably going to end up, like, creating, like, an ocean basin or a cliff or some other geographical location. And here, this is actually something I saw on my way here on the Orient Express when, um, obviously this isn't the train that I was in, but there was another one close behind. And as you can see, Ilva the Snow Lady has taken to using angle weights to try to shape the mountainous region. Like it's, it's like those old Norse uh, creation myths about how like mountains are actually giant skulls or like teeth or remains of mystical beings that wasn't quite right, but it was still somewhat close to the truth. As you can see, um, Ilva here, um, she is actually using the ankle weights to shape these different mountain ranges. And uh, within a couple of years, that 
train tracks probably going to have to be moved because there are going to be a bunch of mountains in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> uh, and going back to the subject of Ilva, here's one of the mountains she's created. And it's, it's done wonders for tourism in pretty much every region that she's been to because she kind of travels the world, like reshaping mountains. And here, it's at this huge ice rink, which, as you can see, this man, he, he's trying to kind of follow in Ilva's footsteps a little bit by like wearing ankle weights of his own to try and increase the size of that mountain. But it just creates these beautiful like scenic mountain range landscapes, like the one you see here. When you get that near like a tourist location, like an ice rink or something, that that is going to create like a really really nice kind of rustic uh, setting with like that giant skyline in the background. You can see like a sunrise over it with like all the cool shadows and stuff. And all of this is just because of ankle weights. But before you go out and put ankle weights on yourself and go out and try to shape mountains and fjords and the like. Just know that we were wrong. All of this has been the research that I was gathering for the first half of my career, but soon I made a discovery that recontextualized the entire study of ankle weight mountain ranges. What you're about to see is disturbing. This is a glacier. Now, as you can see here, in this glacier that is made out of water, it is um, just collecting on the shore. And as you can see, it's a very mountainous shore because really when you sink into the ocean with your ankle weights, it, it creates like a vortex that sucks in. It's like a whirlpool. And all of the ice within like three miles, uh, depending on the size of the ankle weights, this could be significantly larger, will be sucked into that one location. And that has begun to start pulling some of the ice away from the ice caps into more temperate regions, which is raising sea level dramatically. As you can see here, with like even mountains are starting to be swallowed by the sea. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that we're going to have to stop shaping our landmarks with ankle weights. See, we, we have too many, even here in, um, in Rutgersville, Virginia, we have glaciers that somehow see from that little puddle right there the vortex in that puddle was so strong it managed to drag an entire glacier up onto land obviously it's smaller now because it melted on the course of like being dragged up to this location but so many people are trying to make their own little mountain ranges with with their ankle weights there isn't enough like ice to go around or even dirt to go around like as you can see this mountain is barely the size of that man there it's more of a mound really because when everybody can shape mountains the, there's just not enough mountain building material to go around when you sink into the earth that earth has got to go somewhere else where is it going to go it can't go to the ocean because the ocean is getting bigger because of all the ice caps melting i ladies and gentlemen i implore you not only to stop wearing ankle weights but to fight back, rise up, fight fire with fire. And by fire, I mean ankle weights. And by fire, I also mean ankle weights. As you can see in this picture, one of our brave soldiers of the ankle weight militia is combating the destruction of our environments by putting ankle weights onto his feet and turning them into machines, into weapons of justice. And he is doing a massive crane kick of justice and just righteously raining hellfire down upon those that would tamper with God's green earth with their nefarious ankle weights. Uh, I'm being told I'm out of time. I've got to go. Um, remember what I told you. Don't ever stop fighting. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well done. Very well done. Moving on to our next game of the evening. This game, one you might have seen in our first show, and if you didn't see our first show, check that out. It's also on this YouTube channel. Uh, this game is called New Choice, and I think Hannah Marin can explain it best. All right, so for New Choice, we'll have another two-person scene. Um, it will, once again, go 
pretty normally, but with a twist. At any point during the scene, I can say new choice and the improviser who just spoke has to say something else instead of what they just said. Um, and for this game, our improvisers are Patrick and Moodit. I will be moderating. Um, are we getting a noun? Yes. All right, Patrick and Moodit, how do you feel about Seesaw? All right, you have the floor. Okay, hey man, listen, I'm so sorry I'm late to the playground. I, uh, I, had, to, I had to walk my dog, you know? New choice. I had to walk my cat, you know? New choice. I had to walk my neighbor's dog, you know? New choice. I had to walk my child, you know? New choice. I had to take my elderly grandmother on a walk around the neighborhood to help her arthritic knees, you know? We scheduled this meeting for 3 o'clock on Wednesday, all right? You can't just be showing up 15 minutes late. You know this. Look, I'm sorry, okay? I know punctuality is such a big deal to you, but I just, I got caught up in the moment. What can I say? I was having fun, and... It just slipped my mind. There is nothing I like more than punctuality. New choice. There is nothing I put higher on my list of priorities than punctuality. New choice. Punctuality is my best friend. New choice. Took... Punctuality is my girlfriend. New choice. Punctuality is my boyfriend. New choice. I married punctuality. I if you're so married down, to punctuality, well, I was, then well, I was I was waiting for you. Well, I was waiting for you. I got down on my knee and I proposed to punctuality, and I was on time. Oh yeah, I was on. You're time. on time now, maybe. Don't you remember the time you were? Don't you remember the time you were late to the? Oh, what was it? To the PTA meeting? New choice. Don't you remember the time you were late to our first date? New choice. Don't you remember the time you were late to our son's birth? And you were the one giving birth? Yes, I remember that. Of course, I remember that. Yeah, I think you would. How could I forget? You were late to our seesaw meeting. Inexcusable. You were late to our seesaw meeting. That ring was meant for you. Sasha, you can't, because you were late, I had to propose to punctuality, and now I'm happily married. What is little Timothy going to think? Fine. Timothy can think what Timothy thinks, because you know what? Timothy's this is your fault. I blame now. you, okay? I blame you. That's fine. You're blaming. Jeez, I'm leaving. You were late to our seesaw meeting. Timothy's <laughs> birth. Yeah. It's... He was late. Timothy was also late. He didn't come when we expected him to. That's why I was late. I didn't want to tell you. You know what? To. I, I don't I go I don't want to hear it anymore. Two H E double hockey sticks with your seesaw meeting. I'm done with you. New choice. Goodbye. I'm done with you. New choice. I'm done with you. New what choice. You I'm done with you. You up? I would have been up and you would have been down, and then we would have switched over and over again. But you had to be late. I, I didn't want to tell you about Timothy's late arrival. So I took the blame. New choice. And after all this. So so I so I delayed it even more. New choice. So I I was late. I was even later than Timothy was. New that choice. I didn't want to tell you about it because I'm lying, but you still, 
have held that grudge. He's 12. He's 12, Sasha. You can't, He's lived you 12 can't. years with the name Timothy because you lied about having to have him late. We came up with that as a last resort. We were going to name him Jeremy. New choice. We were going to name him Sasha. New choice. We were going to name him Squidward. He would have loved that. New choice. We were going to name him Andrew the Second after his grandfather. And for what? No, we were going to plan him. We were going to name him Andrew the Second if he came on time because we were punctual for that. On my account. I'm. S I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the punctuality. Okay? I I can't deal with it anymore. See. And if you want to go and you want to go off. <laughs> <laughs> Moving time, on Moody. to our next game. Moving on to our next game of the evening. This is less a game and more a challenge. For one mooted mother. Now What's Muda Mother going to be doing? Oh, none other than slam poetry. <laughs> We're going to give Muda two nouns that Muda has to incorporate in his slam poem. And if he fails to rhyme or incorporate these nouns, we're going to yell at him. Muda, I think Hannah has your guess. I do. Um, how do do we feel about nachos and chimpanzee? <laughs> nachos and chimpanzee? Yep. Okay. Um, I just want to begin uh, by introducing this. It's, it's a poem by one of my favorite poets of all time, really. His name is Faze Ali Faze. And it's writing, and it uh, goes a little like this. A man walked along a lonely road, counting his fingers, counting his toes, for he was hungry. He eats not what he knows, only bread, milk, and nachos. He explores the world as he walks along, looking at sights, singing at songs. He sings to the trees, and he sings to the bees giving lots of hugs to his friends, the chimpanzees. This man lived a beautiful life all through the end. And today we tell the story of our dear friend. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was amazing. Better than I had ever hoped for. I was so happy. Our final game of the evening is going to be Jeopardy. Now, how is this version of Jeopardy going to work? Well, we're going to improvise the answers to the questions, improvise the questions, and improvise the categories and point values. However, I will be keeping track of those point values. Do keep that in mind, improvisers. And I will be your host. Welcome to Jeopardy. Tonight, we're going to get started. We have nine contestants, and we're going to get started with the category of medieval weaponry. Our first question for 500 points. This type of catapult was used in the siege of Constantinople. Gallum Ackerman. Um, what is a really bendy spoon? That is correct. Let me take Baroque era composers for 300. This composer has the first name of Wolfgang. Mood it. Um, who is Lil Wolfgang Yachty? That is incorrect, Griffin. Uh, who is um, Johnny Appleseed? That is correct. Uh, I'll take um, improv games for 200. This game is being played right now. Colin Ryan. Uh, what is Wheel of Fortune? That is incorrect. Benjamin Herring. 
What is Super Mario Bros. 64? That is incorrect. B. What is Yes And? That is correct. Uh, can I get uh, Big Burly Men for three, please? This man goes into the forest and chops wood, typically lives in a log cabin, and will hold you tight in their big, strong arms. Colin Ryan. Who is Mr. Esham? That is correct. Great. Could I get a um, terrible music artist for uh, negative one? This song composed by this artist was voted the worst of 2007. Billy Atkinson. Who is Lil Wolfgang Yachty? That is correct. Um, yeah, I'll take the solar system for 400. The planet Jupiter is known as this. B. Burns. What is Space Jam? That is incorrect. Benjamin Herring. Um, what is the concept of gravity? That is incorrect. Mudit Mother. What is the big one? That is correct. Awesome. Um, let me get smelly things for uh, 300. You wear them on their feet? Griffin Keel. What? What are gloves? That is correct. Uh, can I get uh, cool hats for 8 million? This hat was once worn by Prince. Griffin Keel. What's a crown? That is incorrect. <laughs> Mood at Mother. What is a fez? That is incorrect. Benjamin Herring. What is an empty tortoise shell? That is correct. Uh, can I get um, border disputes for 500? This border has been disputed for a real long time. Callum Ackerman. What is the colorful border on the edge of a one-pager? That is correct. Can I take marine life for 300? This is the largest mammal on Earth. Mood at Mother. What is your mom? That is correct. Awesome. Uh, let me get uh, audible noises for 12. Ah! Colin Ryan. Uh, what is Patrick Vernon? That is incorrect. B. Burns. What is the element of surprise? That is correct. Uh, I'll take grapes for 600. Grapes with seeds? Root of Mother. What is you? That is correct. And seen. <laughs> that concludes the Jeopardy showing up tonight. The winner is you. That's right. You won by coming out here tonight and enjoying our show. Thank you. And goodbye. This star. And that letter. I hit it. It didn't stay though. Yes! Yes! Yes, look at that! Yeah. Yes! Yes! I've done this for like an hour. <laughs> yes!
Oh, I'm so proud of that. Oh. The winner of this, of tonight's showing of Jeopardy is... So... They will get a prize from me. It'll be ice cream.